Thanks, thanks. It's great to see that there are so many of you who are interested in microservices, because you know, obviously there's a natural synergy between microservices and Docker. They really go together. And so in this talk, I'm going to add events into, a, into the mix, and you have what I call a perfect trio. In fact, this, this talk is brought to you by the number three. Um, <laughs> it turns out that there are some other big ideas in this talk, actually two other ideas making three ideas, and all, and all three of these big ideas are actually comprised of three different parts, so three times three, which somehow is special. So big idea, of course, is that microservices and events and Docker work together really, really well to enable you to deploy, develop and deploy your applications very effectively. But before I get into that, a little bit about me. So I live in Oakland, um, got my start in programming back in the mid 80s, building Lisp systems, everything from runtimes all the way up to the stack to interactive development environments. About 10 years ago, my book, Pojos in Action, um, which is all about Spring and Hibernate and how they were revolutionizing enterprise Java development came out. And then back in 2007, I started tinkering around with this, what was then a very obscure service known as Amazon EC2. Um, it was back in the beta program. Blew my mind, the idea that you could provision 20 servers, pay 10 cents an hour per server, right? And I ended up creating a startup called Cloud Foundry, which was then acquired by SpringSource shortly before SpringSource was acquired by VMware. So that was back in 2009. And it, today's Cloud Foundry, I should say, is, is sort of, uh, there's none of my technology, just the name. And I can't even claim credit for that because my wife came up with it. <laughs> so, um, so that was a number of years ago. And since then, I specialize, I do consulting and training with sort of a particular focus on, on microservices. I also am a founder of a, of a startup, and we're creating a platform that lets, that makes it easier for developers at, at enterprises to create business applications based on microservices. And as some of the ideas from this talk actually kind of feed, it, feed into the, the sort of related to the product as well. And if you want to know more about microservices, um, go to learnmicroservices.io, where there's pointers to a collection of resources, everything from blog posts, videos, online training, and, and, and so on. Example code as well. Okay, so talks comprised of three parts. First, I'm going to talk about a big sort of choice you have to make at the architectural level. Are you going to use a monolithic architecture or a microservice architecture? Because there's trade-offs there. Then I'm going to talk about how an event-driven approach solves some key challenges that you have to deal with when you're building a microservice architecture. And then I'm going to finish up by talking about how Docker fits in and how it can simplify uh, both deployment and development. So let's get started. So let's imagine that you're building a complex application, which probably almost everyone in this room is, right? We sort of, we don't spend our time building trivial applications. And the example I like to use is an online store. And I'll show bits of the design in a moment. But I think it's safe, you know, it's safe to say that in order to successfully develop software, there are three things that you have to get right. The architecture, the organizational structure, and the processes that you have to use. There's a strong consensus around the idea as of rather than having very, very large development teams, you know, 20, 30, 40, or even more people, really what you want to do is break up your engineering organization into a team of teams. Each team is small comprised of, a, say, of a, say, of at most 12 people, ideally just six to eight, right? Those teams should be autonomous, able to work fairly independently. And then there's also a lot of consensus to say that we should be developing using agile processes, right? Ideally um, using continuous delivery, or better yet, continuous deployment. So that's organization, small, autonomous, agile teams who are delivering continuously. But what about architecture? So at a high level, there's two choices that you have to make. Am I going to build a monolithic application or a microservice-based application? 
So let's look at the monolithic approach. So here's my online store. And as you can see, it's both layered and modular. So there's a presentation layer that's we're exposing a REST API, in, but also generating HTML for, for the browser. There's various modules that implement different pieces of business functionality, like the catalog service, the review, the, the mod, the, the review module, the orders module, and so on. So it's got a nice layered modular architecture. But when we use the monolithic architectural approach, we package everything up as the application, right? just this big monolithic application. So in the Java world, that would be an ear file, a war file, or a jar file. And there's analogous to packaging mechanisms in other languages as well. And the application uses the database. So in fact, most applications I've built over the years have had this architecture. And there's a good reason for that. This architecture, or applications with this architecture in the beginning are pretty simple to, to develop, test, deploy, and scale. All our tooling is around building the application, testing is easy, and so on. The trouble that you have is that successful applications have a habit of growing. We don't just build an application and stop development. We continue to develop the application. So the team of developers is just making the application a little bigger every day committing code, right? And you do that for long enough, you know, in some cases, 10 years. The other day, I was talking to a client where they started selling it. They had a very successful demo. They started selling it. And 10 years later, they had an application that was a million and a half lines of code. Um, and the problem you have is once you have a large, complex application, any notion of being agile just goes away as everything about developing and deploying that application becomes extremely painful. Also, from an organizational point of view, because everybody's contributing to the same code base, there's really no autonomy between the teams. The process of delivering or releasing an application involves like complex merging and days of pain and, and so on. You end up in this situation that I call monolithic hell. Um, and I'm sure some of you are, are, exp are living that every day, because it's quite common. I feel like there's a certain inevitability that given enough time, your key, bit, your key application will become painful to work with. So what's the solution? Well, the solution, of course, is to use the microservice architecture. And what got me interested in this approach before the name was sort of, before, actually before the name existed, was I read this book, The Art of Scalability, which to me is a must-read book written by some architects who worked at eBay. And in the book, they have this three-dimensional model of scalability, another use of, of three. And so there's three different axes along which you can scale your application. So there's the x-axis scaling, which is where you run multiple copies of your application behind a load balancer. There's, that's running multiple monoliths. There's z-axis scaling, where you're running multiple copies, but instead of it running behind a simple load balancer, it's behind a router that inspects the request and uses some attribute of it to route that request to a particular server. So in the database world, that would be sharding, where you use the, the primary key of a row to decide which server that row should reside on. Both x and z-axis scaling are all about monoliths. But what's really interesting is y-axis scaling, or in other words, functional decomposition. So that's where you break up your application, you break up your monolith into a set of smaller applications or services. And that, that to me, is my definition of, my, of the microservice architecture, is, is functional decomposition. So when we apply that to the online store, we end up with an architecture that looks like this. So what were previously modules within our application now become standalone, independently deployable and scalable services, each one of which has its own database. That's a key attribute of the microservice architecture, which actually creates, which has a lot of benefits, but creates problems that I'm going to talk about in a little while. And then sitting in front of those services is the API gateway, which acts as a facade. It exposes an API 
that clients of those services use, clients such as a, um, a web application or a JavaScript client running in a browser or a, or a mobile client accessed via a REST API. So that's the microservices architecture in a nutshell. And the nice thing about it is that it enables agile development and continuous deployment. It also enables the teams to act autonomously. So each team owns one or more services. They're able to develop that service independently, deploy it independently, and scale it independently. So it sort of fits very well with, the, with sort of modern organizational thinking and also modern thinking around processes as well. So it's really good. And there's other benefits as well. It lets you much more easily adopt new technologies, because when you're writing a new, new microservice, you can pick a new technology at that point. You know you're no longer stuck with using the same technology stack throughout your application, which will become increasingly obsolete over time. So there are some drawbacks, however. Right? And by far, the biggest drawback of the microservice architecture is complexity. You know, things are sort of complex at this point. So number one, you're developing a distributed system. So what that means is that whereas before, when module A called module B, that was just a language level method call or function call, you know, really, really simple development, you now have to deal with inter-process communication, which on the one hand, that yes, there are frameworks for doing messaging and frameworks for doing RPC, but it's just complicated, more complicated, right? Not only that, you have to deal with this concept of partial failure, which we, you did not have to deal with before. So in other words, when you call some other service, that service might not be, de might not be up or it might be really, really slow. So you might not get back a response ever. It might just sort of permanently hang. And you as a developer have to be mindful of that and have to program for that scenario. Also, as I mentioned, we've split up our databases, and, and yet we still have business transactions that need to maintain data consistency across those databases. And that becomes really tricky, especially because we can't use the traditional approach of, of two-phase commit. Distributed transactions are not a viable option for modern, modern architectures. It's also, testing is more complicated as well, because um, you might want to test a service, but that service could have a whole tree of transitive dependencies. Also, just deploying and operating your, your application is a lot more complex. Whereas before, there was one, one monolith, and you just ran n copies of it. Now, there are tens or hundreds of um, microservices, and you need to have so many instances of each one of them. So there's many more moving parts that have to be deployed and monitored and managed and so on. Nice thing is that you know, there are, there, like as we saw in the keynote today, um, you know, there's sort of Docker-based orchestration technologies that can actually make that a lot, a, what can take away an awful lot of the pain. It's also challenging to implement features that span multiple services. A whole bunch of planning has to be done. Um, so that's just another complication. But the nice thing is, you know, as I hinted at, right, like there are solutions to most of these problems, either sort of process, sort of um, like you can do scaling, you can use scaled agile techniques to coordinate across the teams. Um, Docker orchestration technologies take care of a lot of the deployment pain. And later on, I'm going to talk about how you can use events to ensure data consistency across um, different databases. So it's, it's better. Um, and unlike with a monolithic application where you, there, there are no solutions to its complexity and you just have to suffer quietly, um, you know, we've got, got viable solutions here. So in general, for large complex applications, the benefits of microservices tend to outweigh the drawbacks. So that, that's good. But having said that, there are a whole bunch of issues to address, like how do you deploy them? How do they communicate? How do clients of the application communicate with the services? How do you actually break up your application? 
And how do you do, deal with these distributed data management problems that result from breaking up your databases? So there's just sort of a whole bunch of issues. And you know, I'm going to touch on a couple of them, namely using events to manage data consistency and using Docker to actually deploy your system. OK, so that's um, look at the whole um, you know, event-driven approach. So if you, you know, we think about well, your question, what's the database architecture in a, mic in a microservice system? Um, you know, you've got two choices. You could have a single shared database, or you could have a database per service. And I've kind of already hinted at the fact that you actually have a database per service, but let's look at the concept of a shared database. So in this e-commerce application, you've got the order service that has the order table, and you have the customer service that has the customer table. And so the order table's got columns like the order total. The customer table has columns like the customer's credit limit. So each service owns some tables, but they also access one another's. So for instance, in order to check that the customer's credit limit will not be exceeded by a new order, the order service goes and looks at the customer table. Likewise, the customer service, in order to calculate the available credit for a customer, goes and looks at the order table. And on the one hand, that's kind of nice. You know, this is a, actually a kind of simple programming model, right? We're used to programming with ACID transactions that enable us to you know, easily enforce invariants like credit limits and, and so on. So it's kind of nice, and also operationally it's good. There's just the database to manage, so the DBAs and the uh, ops people are happy. But on the other hand, there's tight coupling. So for instance, if I'm working on the order service and I want to change the database schema, I have to go, to talk, I have to go and talk to all of the teams that are, whose services are also accessing the order table. And as you know, once you kind of have to coordinate with other people, other teams inside your organization, things slow down. So the teams lose their autonomy. And what's worse, in some organizations, this is common today, people lose track of who's accessing what table. And as a result, you can't change anything, right? So it's sort of like, you know, it, it, it's, it's a slippery slope and, and, and best avoided. So the recommended approach in a microservice architecture is for each service to have its own database. Or another way of putting it, each service should have its own private data that is only accessible through that service's API. You want to properly encapsulate the data. So the order service has an order database that has the order table. Customer service has the customer database that has the customer table, and so on. And this, this ensures that you have loose coupling, which is good. On the other hand, it's a bit more complicated. You might actually have to be operating multiple databases, especially if you've adopted a polyglot persistence architecture and you're using a variety of NoSQL and SQL databases as well. So your ops people have, you know, have a more complex infrastructure to manage. Plus, you have this problem of, well, if I've split things up, how do I maintain data consistency across, the two, uh, across multiple databases? Especially because in, in modern applications, you cannot use two-phase commit. Because of things like the CAP theorem, plus just the practicalities of using distributed transactions, it tends to be a very bad choice for modern applications. So this creates problems. So, you know, to use the example I've kind of hinted at earlier, so in this application, let's suppose that customers have a credit limit. And so when you want to place an order, you have to verify that that order will not exceed the credit limit. If orders and customers are in the same database, trivial. You just begin a transaction, access the data, create an order, commit it, and you're done. And the ACID transaction model t handles the scenario where multiple requests are simultaneously trying to create orders. You get the serializable aspect of database transactions. But if you split up orders into one database, customers in another, how on earth, and, you, and you're not using two-phase commit, how on earth do you do this? 
So the solution, of course, is to use an event-driven architecture. And the idea is that whenever something happens of significance, such as a, a, a state change, or in other words, when one service updates data, it publishes an event. Another service can consume that event and react accordingly, update its own data. And by, by basically chaining together a series of transactions where one transaction emits an event that triggers another transaction, you can achieve eventual consistency in your system. So in the order management system, when a request comes in to place an order, the order service creates an order in a pending state. It emits an event to indicate that it's done that. That event is consumed by the customer service, which goes and performs the credit check and actually reserves credit. To, it keeps track of the fact that order XYZ has allocated so much of the available credit. And then it, it emits an event indicating the outcome of the credit check. So if the, create, if the credit reservation was successful, it would emit a credit reserved event. And if it was unsuccessful, it emits a credit check failed event. Those events get consumed by the order service, which can then change the state of the order accordingly. So instead of this happening in one a local ACID transaction, what we have is a series of, well, three local ACID transactions, and eventually the state is, becomes consistent at that point. So that, that's an approach that I first read about um, eBay using to maintain consistency across their partitioned um, SQL databases some number of years ago. But there's a little challenge. In order for this to work reliably, you actually have to atomically update the database, like insert an order or change the state of the order or a customer, and emit an event. So there's two things that have to be done atomically. And if you think about it, the traditional way of doing that in an enterprise application is with a distributed transaction. Right? You begin a distributed transaction, you update the database, you update the message broker, and then you commit the transaction, and that will guarantee that those two things happen atomically. But of course, you know, as I've discussed, you cannot use distributed transactions in modern applications. So you're sort of like, well, how am I going to reliably publish events? It turns out there's a whole variety of strategies that you can use. Um, ranging from the application explicit, you are using the database table, database table as, an, as a message queue. So that's the bottom one. You can actually do it with database triggers. You can tail the database transaction log. And, you can, and then there's, there's also a technique called event sourcing that I, I've been using successfully for a while now. And I'm going to talk about, I, I, there's actually a, an article that I wrote that goes into this in more detail. I'm just going to focus on event sourcing, which is really, really interesting. And the whole idea with event sourcing is it's basically an event-centric approach to persistence. Um, and, the, and of course, in other words, so for instance, with, with um, the way you'd actually store an order is as a sequence of state-changing events. So when you create an order, you insert an event into an event table saying that the order was created. You would then when, say, the order was approved, like the credit check was the, um, succeeded, and you'd insert an order approved event. And then when the order was shipped, you'd insert an order shipped event. And that's the, that's the official sort of system of record for that order. So there's no, there's, that you, you don't have a row in an order table that's got the current state. All you're storing is, is the current, is a sequence of events. And the reason that helps in this scenario is rather than you having to update the database and publish an event, you simply insert an event into the event table, which is one atomic action. So it solves the atomicity problem. And then if anyone is, at least conceptually, if anyone is interested in the, in subscribing to the events, they can just pull the event table. 
In practice, you'd use a much more elaborate scheme than that, but that, that's sort of the big idea. And then, if you need to reconstruct the current state of the order, you load its events, and you, you can think of the, uh, this process of replaying them to reconstruct the current state. In a functional sense, you're actually doing a fold over the stream of events to, to recompute the current state. So that's event sourcing. It's an event-centric approach to persisting your domain objects that at the same time has this wonderful benefit of your generating a stream of events out of your system, um, which, among other things, solves the data consistency problems in a microservice architecture, and also in, a, it, in scenarios where you're using NoSQL databases as well with limited transactional capabilities. It also means that you've got this wonderfully reliable event publishing mechanism. So when, en when anything happens within, one of your, within your system, an event is published, you can feed that into a predictive analytics engine. Um, you, can, you can use it to send out user notifications via email or via SMS. So it's like whenever something happens, an event is generated, which can be then consumed somewhere else and, and get something done. It also eliminates the object relational impedance mismatch problem. Because you're no longer storing domain objects, we no longer have the problem of mapping them to a relational database schema, because all we're storing are the events that have a simpler structure. Also, because each state change is represented by an event, we have a 100% reliable audit log. We can save the identity of the user that caused the change in the event. And if there was no change, no event, the, you know, we're, there's, we were just sort of guaranteed that we, we've got this reliable audit log, which is really, really good, as opposed to having to like bolt on auditing as an afterthought. Also, because we've, we're saving the entire history of each domain object in this system, we can actually go back in time and ask what the state of um, an object was you know, historically. So we can perform temporal queries, which is extremely powerful. You know, there's some domains that are heavily regulated, so you need to know who did what when or what was the state of the world when a particular trade happened. And so this system actually preserves that. And then not only that, we've actually, from a sort of system point of view, we have a complete history of everything that has happened in the system, you know, at least conceptually, since the beginning of time. So when we, today, we implement a new feature, we can actually feed past events, all of the past events, into that new, the, the module that implements that new feature, and it effectively as if, behaves as if we had implemented that feature from day one, which sounds really cool, you know, sounds cool. I haven't actually tried it, but I think, but you could imagine doing that, right? Um, but of course, you know, like everything, there are drawbacks, right? So it requires an application rewrite. You know, it's a different way of structuring our core business logic. Though the nice thing is, you know, if you're migrating to a microservice architecture, you're having to do a code rewrite anyway, so it could kind of fit in with that effort. It's also a, a somewhat slightly weird and unfamiliar way of structuring your business logic. Um, so there's a learning curve. The nice thing is, is that event sourcing has sort of been around for quite some time, and there's, there's this, you know, it's a subset of the domain-driven design community. And so there is this body of knowledge and, and articles and resources that can help get you started. Another interesting aspect, challenge, at least in theory, is that these events, once they've been published, never go away. And that's great, because you've got this durable Audit, audit trail for your system. The downside, of course, is if you have a badly designed event, you might have to live with it forever. If ever you do a replay of all the past events, you have to deal with um, some badly designed event. Though usually events have a pretty simple structure. You know, they're very much rooted in the um, problem domain. 
they tend not to be very complex. But there are issues around um, event schema evolution. Also, you have to handle duplicate events. So you've got to have either item potent event handlers or you have to do duplicate detection. But there are usually very simple strategies for doing that. Also, querying the event store can be challenging, right? Like if you want to imagine you're storing um, account debits and credit events and you want to write a query that finds all accounts that have a particular balance. Your SQL query would actually have to like um, kind of combine the events. You'd end up having to write nested SQL queries, which would be kind of complex um, and po possibly inefficient. So there's a challenge there. Um, so there's some, you know, like everything, there are definite trade-offs. And I, but my sense is, you know, event sourcing has been around for a while and. You know, to me, it was always a curiosity, but as soon as I started building microservices, it became a great way of solving the data consistency problems. And what's nice is that there is a strategy for dealing with queries. So <clears throat> let's imagine that you want to find, you know, in your system, recent valuable customers. So customers who have recently placed high value orders. Now, if everything was in the one database, that would be a trivial SQL query, right? Just a join between customers and orders with the appropriate where clause. Now, in a microservice architecture, that's no longer easy. Customers and orders could be in, the, in different databases, so we can't do that. And then what's more, if we're using event sourcing, writing a query involving the current state is no longer trivial, uh, as, as I mentioned earlier. So this is a problem. The nice thing is there's an architectural approach known as command query responsibility segregation, where you split your system in two. You have the command side that's implementing, your, that has the domain objects, and it handles the commands, the HTTP puts, posts, and deletes. You have a query side that handles the HTTP gets, by querying one or more materialized views of your data, which could be, a, could be Mongo, could be Redis, could be Neo4j, could even be SQL or Elasticsearch, depending on the types of queries that you need to execute in order to perform those GET requests. And then what's really cool is that the two sides are kept synchronized, the views are kept synchronized by consuming the events that are coming out of the command side. And so this is a way of basically supporting a diverse range of, of queries in a high-performance, scalable way, while at the same time using event sourcing. So if any of you are using, say, Elasticsearch in conjunction with MySQL, in a sense, this approach is sort of a generalization of that concept. You know, there's definitely complexities there, but there are also some pretty big benefits. All right, so I kind of talked about some architectural ideas, right? You know, microservices at a high level using events and using CQRS um, to deal with data uh, management problems. And I want to finish up, you know, since this is um, DockerCon, I have to talk about Docker, right? <laughs> um, so, but what's cool is, you know, I've actually been using Docker for I don't know, a couple of years now. Just blows, and actually this is the first time I've been to DockerCon, and I guess this Docker thing is catching on, right? Um, just blown away by, by the size and the energy of this event. So, okay, so, you know, so you've, you've decided, you've built your system using the microservice architecture, and it's like, well, how do we deploy it? And we have, you know, you now have some really unique challenges, right? Instead of a single monolith, albeit a large one, you've now got lots and lots of services. So there's a lot of moving parts that need to be deployed, orchestrated, and monitored, and so on. Um, and there's a lot of sort of interesting issues that you have to deal with. So services can be written in a variety of different languages and frameworks, and maybe even versions of languages and versions of frameworks. So that there's a deployment challenge there. Each service consists of multiple instances for scalability and availability reasons. 
Um, building and deploying a service should be fast, right? We want to practice continuous deployment, so it shouldn't take a long time to build a service and have it up and running in production. We want to be able to deploy and scale each service independently. The services should be isolated from one another, so we don't want a malfunctioning service to consume all of the CPU or all of the memory of a particular machine. And then also the, the process of doing deployment needs to be reliable. We shouldn't stress about it, right? We should be able to do it many times a day without having a panic attack or having late nights or anything like that, you know, which is sort of the traditional deployment scenario. And not only that, it should also be cost effective, right? Because, well, most of us work for businesses that have to generate profit, right? So, so you know, having cost effective um, production environments is, is important. So it turns out, of course, there's a variety of different deployment options, right? So ranging from the traditional approach of, well, just getting a few machines, giving them cute names, and running multiple instances of servers, uh, of services on each one, right? So I'm calling that the multiple services per host pattern. So that's kind of the old school way of doing it, and probably you know, it's generally not a good idea today. And so the better approach is to use a, have a single service instance on each host. And a host is, is either a virtual machine, like an EC2 instance, or it's a container, as in a Docker container. And, each, and once, actually, once you get into it, you know, there are various trade-offs involved with each approach. Um, but you know, I think sort of the whole container-based approach is by you know st starting to prove itself as you know an incredibly effective way of deploying your applications. So and of course you know Docker is is the way to do it. And this by the way this was a, cargo, a container ship Benjamin Franklin that visited the port of Oakland at the end of last year. It's like 1,400 feet long and it has 18,000 containers on it. So yeah, got to have the obligatory container ship photo in the talk. So of course, the big idea, right, is that you take your service, compile it if you need to, and then you package it up as a container image. And then at runtime, you know, at each instance of your service is a container that is probably running on, on um, a virtual machine. Or it could be running on bare metal. That's sort of emerging to be a viable option as well. And that's really good, right? Containers give you, give you good isolation between your services. They give you good, mani good manageability, right? Also, it encapsulates the implementation technology. Once you've packaged up your application as a container image, it doesn't matter that it's a Ruby or a Node or a Java or Scala application. It just becomes a container image that can be started and stopped. Also, you know, the container mechanism is a super lightweight OS level virtualization technique. So you get, unlike virtual machines, you get very, very efficient resource utilization. You can pack multiple containers on a virtual machine. Also, it's incredibly fast as well. So like on my laptop, it takes a few seconds to build an image a little long, you know, say 20 seconds to push it into a registry, 20 seconds to pull it down onto a production server, and then when you start a container, it just starts up immediately. So what's that? 45 seconds from the build finishing to a container in the production environment, which is really, really cool. So that, you know, so that, that's really good. And then not only that, I mean, I have found Docker to be invaluable at, during development as well, specifically with what Docker Compose gives you, right? And this came up in the keynote, where getting a developer desktop set up with the right versions of all of the infrastructure services that you need has historically been a pain, right? Because especially in modern applications where we're going to have a whole host of services, now, that just gets represented by a Docker Compose file. And this one says, well, I need RabbitMQ 353 and MongoDB 3.0.4. And then I just go Docker Compose up, and my, there's my sort of infrastructure services running, which is inc incredibly useful. 
Not only that, when it's time to do sort of some notion of end-to-end -end test or integration test between the services, it's really, really convenient to just have a Docker Compose file that deploys those services. So I just go Docker Compose up, and it just in launches instances of all of my services. And so that, that you know, it's, that's a regular part of my sort of day as a developer is you know, making use of Docker Compose for that. And, the, you know, it's pretty basic stuff, but it's made my life as a developer a lot easier. And then not only that, so my, you know, for every service, I have a Jenkins-based deployment pipeline that, end, that basically emits a Docker image. And what's one of the, one of the interesting things that it, one of the intermediate steps is after actually building the Docker image, it uses the Docker daemon's REST API to actually launch the a container, and it just runs a smoke test on it. And that, that's kind of nice, just to have a sanity check that I haven't built a Docker container that, that's completely broken. Um, and then, you know, then the other thing that's sort of one final point is that Docker, um, sorry, Jenkins itself is actually deployed as a Docker container along with Artifactory, that's sort of a Java repository server, um, as Docker containers on an EC2 instance. And then any data that I want to um, persist is actually on an EBS volume and then volume mapped into the container. And so I've had, you know, been running this kind of setup for probably a year, well, a year and a half now, if not longer. And it's been really, really good. So, so yeah, Docker, microservices just works really, really well together. And so, yeah, so that's my talk. Hope that you found it useful. So it's kind of in summary, right? Like you use microservices to accelerate development. You want to use an event-driven architecture to maintain data consistency across your microservices. And you want to use Docker to simplify not only the development of your applications, but also the deployment. So that's my talk. Hope you found it useful. And please, you know, if you've got questions, you know, contact me, email, Twitter, and also check out learnmicroservices.io. So thank you. We've got, uh, oh, you get, you get the idea. OK, good. So I got a question. Um, I'm not bashing CQRS, but I mean, it's well known that it has a lot of pitfalls, and there's a lot of companies that have failed doing that. In fact, uh, Martin Fowler says right on his site he doesn't personally recommend it for a lot of approaches. Um, so my question is, isn't about like so much as failures, but what could you, for people using my CQRS, what are some best practices or things that you should avoid? Oh. Um, because I'm sure you're aware, you know, just the, just the, you know, there is a lot of negativity around yeah. in the community. And you don't see it in the valley very often either, as far as like a common way of architecture. So, so, so I guess one thought I would have is, right, like, you know, all of these, every sort of architectural pattern has both benefits and drawbacks, right? So you could argue that, say, if you're building a monolithic application, um, that might tilt the scales in favor of not using CQRS, right? Likewise, with event sourcing as well. I mean, for me, both of those were just curiosities. Yet, as soon as you get into the microservice architecture, there are these hard technical problems that you have to solve, which I think tilts the scale back in favor of event sourcing and CQRS, right? You know, it's all about, you know, abstractly, it's all about pain minimization, right? And, and so there's, depending on the context, there, there are different trade-offs. And then the other point I would make is I, I kind of feel like a lot of, so, I know a lot of new economy companies are often more about um, kind of the, the that sort of the kinds of applications that they write are often kind of read-only, <laughs> other than a, analyzing a vast stream of analytics, right? Whereas if you think about a lot of enterprise business applications, those are very transactional in nature, which I think will encourage the use of techniques like event sourcing. All right, that's all we have time for, unfortunately. If you have a question for Chris, you can come and grab him now. Yeah, uh, let's I'm, I'm down here. Applause. Thank you.